So our next speaker is Vincent von Hooker. So Vincent is a principal scientist at the Google Brain machine learning team. He also leads the Google research effort on robotics. He's not going to talk today uh, about robotics, but over my years at Google, uh, Vincent is one of the persons from whom I learned the most in terms of machine learning. So I'm really happy that he's going to share some of that wisdom today with us. Thanks, Olivier. Um, I wanted to quickly, somebody asked earlier about training on device and what kind of workloads are interesting in that respect. I just wanted to rebound on this. If you, have a, if you have an Android device right now and you plug it at night, chances are that it trains a neural network for you at night to update, uh, in particular, the keyboard uh, suggestions that you have. So definitely training on device is something that's happening. It enables us to really uh, sort of train on things that we wouldn't want to be putting in the cloud, like what you're typing on your keyboard. And we're going to see, my guess is uh, that we're going to see a lot more of that. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, area to, um, to, to start thinking about. But I'm not going to talk about this uh, today. I was going to talk more about. Um, learning to co-design, and in, in a sense, what I would call true co-design, in the sense that um, both we try to design better hardware for machine learning, but we also try to design machine learning architectures and ways to approach problems in machine learning for the uh, kind of hardware that we have. Um, I wanted to tell a, a little bit of a story of uh, an accidental co-design, one time where when um, the, the hardware capabilities magically enabled uh, deep learning in a very, very early days. So back in 2011, which is prehistory by uh, deep learning standards, uh, not many people were thinking about deep learning. There was really no, not much attention uh, put to it. We didn't have any GPUs in our data centers, only everything was running on CPU. And we have these magical new neural networks that were huge and that were extremely slow. And even using the fastest blast on Intel, we couldn't get them to run. And um, I started really thinking hard about how was I going to productionize those systems. I was working on speech recognition at the time. And I became obsessed with um, there was this one weird uh, instruction in the Intel instruction set in the middle of the SSSE3 specification. Uh, nobody, you, you could miss it very easily if you didn't really look at the details of, of the spec. Um, it was a weird instruction because it had no analog anywhere. It was taking eight uh, signed 8-bit integers, taking eight unsigned integers, and multiply and added them together with this weird 16-bit saturation in the middle. It seems to be a very, very specialized, weird instruction. I have no idea why it was used for. If you looked on the internet, nobody was really using it for anything except for chess. Uh, there were a few, a few like super-optimized chess routines that were able to take advantage of it for some reason. Um, and it was weird because it, because of the saturation, it wasn't even bit exact, right? You could uh, get overflows and so, um, you couldn't do exact computation with it. Um, but for the neural nets of the time, it was actually perfect. Like we started at the time to play with ReLU, rectified linear units, right? So we had those activations that were positive and mostly on the linear scale. I mean, now we know that you know nonlinear quantization actually works better, but at the time it wasn't completely obvious. Um, we have signed weights, we have unsigned activation, we wanna multiply, add them together to do fast matrix multiplies. We thought 8-bit was going to be enough. We weren't sure quite at the time. You know, there was some lore that, you know, back in the 90s, uh, they had shown that, you know, they could just use 5 bits or 6 bits and everything was fine, but it was still murky. And, and that accidental, like, aha, I can really use this instruction for my neural network became a bit of an obsession. And so we started looking truly into quantization at the time and really moving to quantized 8-bit operations is what enabled what I think is the first uh, deployment at large scale of real-time deep learning system. It was inside the, the Google Voice search and uh, keyboard dictation um, and it really sort of bootstrapped our use of deep learning at Google in general. So this is one time where everything kind of came together in some way and really enabled us. Um, there is a ton of ist uh, stories of accidental anti-design, right? That's when machine learning scientists come up with a new model, a new approach that you know, works better, 
but then we go to the hardware designers or the, the, the platforms people and they look at us and are like, what have you done? <laughs> so one example is batch normalization. Uh, so without going into the details, we have those convolutional nets that are you know, very dense and very data local operations all the way up the stack. And what we do is, is in between each of them adds multiple reductions in the middle that basically traverse the entire data and that force uh, a very, you know, very not data or very not compute intensive operations that kind of break this entire flow. Um, with RNN, same thing. So we have this, you know, uh, recurrent neural network it has some nice features. You can uh, the, the 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 weights stay very local. You're just recursing through them and and going through them um, um, repeatedly at every time step. And then come WaveNet, which is taking the recurrent neural network, but adding dependencies that are really, really long range and that break completely these data locality assumptions. So there's a lot of cases where we start doing things that are completely hostile to the hardware just because it improves performance and it enables things. And after the fact, we have to really think about, okay, why is this slow? And, and, and actually spend a lot of time back thinking back about how we're going to make those things actually efficient. Um, but but the, the, the fact remains that a lot of what we do in machine learning, they're actually design choices. We're not necessarily forced into them. There is a huge space of uh, things that we can try. And this is an example from uh, Eugenio, who, who is going to be uh, talking uh, uh, later, a, a paper that describes kind of the operations versus top one accuracy of all the popular vision models. And, and all those models look very different from each other. They operate somewhere on that performance curve. And you have a lot of choices that you could, you know, if you could sweep that curve exhaustively, you would probably do very well and, and, uh, and have a lot, a lot more freedom to design things that are much, much faster and much more, more efficient. Um, so the question is, can hardware designers influence the modeling process, right? Right now we're kind of working on our modeling completely independently of speed and then we come to the hardware folks and say, hey, please make that fast. Can we inverse the, the process? And there is a very interesting trend uh, right now, which might enable this, and I really hope will enable this. It's this idea of learning to learn, uh, also called meta-learning meta in, in, in various circles. Um, the idea is to turn the, uh, the, the machine learning model design into something that we actually learn instead of do by hand. And the opportunity there is that once we have something that is just learning, that is being trained to design an architecture, it's very easy to inject hardware constraints into the process because it's no longer somebody who's actually manually doing this design. It's something that is basically driven by a cost function. And as soon as you have a cost function, you, it's very easy to, or it's easier to inject any sort of arbitrary constraints into that uh, cost function. So why are we going into learning to learn? Um, there is a, a popular mantra in, uh, in SRE circles at, at Google, which is to strive to automate yourself out of your job every 18 months. That should be your real job, should not be to do your job, but to try to automate yourself out of your job. So the, the goal here is to try and take what we have today, which is machine learning experts with some data and some computation, and replace that process with still data a lot more computation, but a lot less human intelligence into the design process. Um, one of the first uh, foray in that direction has been to try to use reinforcement learning to, uh, to, do neural, to design neural networks. And, and, and the, this, the, the idea goes as follows. You, you, uh, you produce a model generator, instead of having a model description that describes all the layers of your model. You have a neural network, which will generate model architectures. That's your generator, and it's, you can sample from it and generate a series of models. You take those models that you've sampled and generated, you train them for you know, a few hours, or as long as it takes. You measure the performance of each of those models, and then you update using reinforcement learning the parameters of the model generator to favor the architectures that are good by some measure of goodness, which typically for us right now is accuracy, but could be a mix of accuracy and performance. 
and you can loop that process. Um, it's extremely expensive because the inner loop of that process is a full training run. So we've all been talking about how expensive it is to train a model. It can take days and weeks. You can imagine that if that's the inner loop of an outer optimization that can also is in the same order of number of epochs that you would want to train a neural network, that can really be um, t take a lot of, uh, of compute. But it works well. So uh, this is uh, an example of a model that was uh, tr uh, trained for the task of CIFAR-10, which is a, an image recognition task. Um, we actually um, landed with a model that's basically state of the art on, uh, on the problem that um, took a lot of GPUs training in parallel for days and days. It produced a model architecture that you see on the left that looks kind of weird. It has a lot of residual connections at random uh, places. It's not very clear what, why that is. But um, it works extremely well, and it's better than you know, the state of the art uh, as of six months ago. So it's basically um, you know, several years worth of uh, hand designed of neural networks that got achieved in, in a matter of weeks. Uh, we've done the same thing, for example, on a language modeling task where, in, in this instance, the, the goal was to learn uh, the inner cell of an LSTM model. So uh, LSTMs are a very popular class of recurrent neural network. They have a little machinery uh, in the middle, um, which is, looks like this. And uh, it's, it, it looks complicated, but there is a, some good you know, reasons and good thinking uh, behind why a LSTM cell looks like this. If you try to evolve an LSTM cell from scratch, you end up with something a little bit more complicated, uh, a little bit more weird looking. But in this case, we actually beat the state of the art with this. And it's actually transferable across different tasks. So if you take that LST, weird LSTM cell that we don't know why it works, but it works better, and you apply it to other tasks, it's actually better than any of the uh, LSTM uh, variants that are out there. Um, so it's very promising uh, because we, you know, we're not just repeating the past. We're not uh, replaying history. We're actually doing something that nobody has done before. So that process we can potentially give us uh, new architectures that are even better than, than what we had before. Um, another uh, approach that we've been experimenting with is instead of using reinforcement learning, using uh, evolutionary processes. Um, the, the idea there is to represent the model in an abstract way using uh, a, uh, also a description of the architecture and turn that into a little strand of uh, virtual DNA. And that DNA can be turned back into a model and the model can be trained and you can measure the fitness. Right? So instead of using reinforcement learning, we're just going to have an evolutionary process where we generate a whole bunch of models, we let them train, we measure their fitness, we let them survive if they're fit, uh, we generate mutations uh, if, they're, um, if, uh, if, if they're fit and they're suitable for the next generation. One interesting twist is that we actually keep with some probability the weights that have been trained and we evolve them in a way that there is actual um, um, if, if there's inheritance of the traits uh, so you can have a model that evolves but we don't we don't uh, throw away all the weights we keep on training on top of that um, yeah so a bunch of possible mutations that are at this point, handcrafted and uh, designed to, for, the, for the problem, but that's actually fairly portable across tasks. This is the kind of uh, uh, training curves that we get. Um, so this has been running on hundreds of CP, uh, GPUs for uh, more than yeah, almost 300 hours. And each point here is one model that has been trained for, uh, that's also for the, the task of CPAR 10. So it's a lot of models. Uh, it, it's a ton of models. It's extremely inefficient. It's extremely costly. But um, you know, once we have a proof of concept that this kind of approach is actually works, then we can start working at making it more efficient. Right? Having getting an upper bound on the performance is really what's what's uh, what's very interesting here. And same story, we get something that's actually pretty uh, competitive. It's almost to the state of the art. It happens to be a lot more compact uh, a model than whatever model was out there in the literature. Um, and it transfers from, uh, at least modestly, from uh, CIFAR 10 to CIFAR 100. So it's, it's actually not completely overfitting to the data. Although there is a lot more work that needs to be done to actually make sure that those models 
are not just fitting to the exact data. We want something that can be uh, transferable uh, at large. Um, another interesting um, aspect is that you know we can learn model architectures, um, but we can also run learn how we use models at runtime. And this is the idea of learning placement. Um, so this is, for example, a, uh, an example of an LSTM that we use for machine translation, right? So the, the task here is A, B, C, D is the input sentence, and then we map it as an output to this A, B, C, D here, which is the output sentence in the different language. And so the, the, the model in the middle is a recurrent model. So there is sharing of the weights across, um, across time there. There is no sharing across the different layers. It's a typical architecture. In practice, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but it's a very high-level high schematic of it. If you were to try and distribute that model over multiple GPUs, you could do something like this. Um, this would and make sure that the data stays local, the weights at least stay local on each GPU, and that seems like a, a plausible uh, you know, way of doing, by, doing it by hand. The question is, can we do better? And can we actually uh, use the same kind of process using reinforcement learning to do device placement and train a model that measures in its, uh, its throughput in the environment and update the placement on the different uh, devices as a result? And so far, it seems to work pretty well. So this is still early results. But this is, a, for example, on the left here, it's a for our machine translation models. We're able to shave off about um, almost a third of the of the time by having a, a, a smarter placement algorithm. Uh, for computer vision, we get about 20% faster than the best human placement we had before. And it seems to be converging better in terms of uh, asynchronous updates as well, uh, which is interesting. Um, that was not part of the design, but it seems that lower latency actually helps with, uh, with uh, the synchronization. Um, this is the kind of layout that's being learned. So that's uh, the, you know, the expanded version of uh, the, the model that I uh, s uh, showed before. Each color here is just a different uh, GPU that has been selected by the design process. So it's a big mess, but um, it seems to actually uh, you know, fit, the, fit, the, day, fit uh, the, the, the system better. And I suggest that really there might be some interesting uh, data dependency that we're not really thinking about uh, or that are possibly too complicated for us to think about in real time in terms of, uh, in terms of how the, the computational flow happens. Um, this is uh, at the top the uh, vision model and uh, the convolutional model with the placement of the different parts of uh, the model on the different GPUs. Um, you can see that some of the convolutional towers are all being put on the same GPU, um, but then the, some of the GPUs get reused up higher up in the convolutional uh, tower. There's some gaps in there. So this is something that we would probably not have come up with ourselves, but um, uh, it turns out to work extremely well. So um, this is very interesting because we can really, we're really, really starting to think very seriously about specialization of, uh, of hardware to a machine learning, right? Um, I mean, it's no news to everybody here. You've been hearing about it uh, all throughout today. Um, for us, it really started uh, more than two years ago. I mean, we started thinking about it even maybe three to four years ago. And um, with uh, the, our, our TPU, or the first version of our trans of the TPUs um, has been in production for quite some time. And so that was a chip that was initially only designed for accelerating inference because that was the biggest problem to serving very expensive uh, models. In particular, the neural translation models are extremely expensive to compute. And uh, uh, the machine translation, we really need very high throughput and very low latency uh, for those models. Um, so they are now used everywhere for every search query that you make on Google will hit a TPU at some point. Uh, we've used it in uh, AlphaGo, like the rack that you see on the right, that's the rack that was used for the AlphaGo game uh, last year with Lee Sedol. Um, the TPU, there is a talk later at uh, this conference. Uh, I believe Dave Patterson will be giving the 
talk, as far as I know, um, that describes the architecture uh, in a lot more detail. <coughs> uh, we, a few weeks ago, we announced the uh, Tensor Processing Unit version 2, and that's a new uh, chip that's uh, designed for neural net training as well as inference. Um, it's 180 teraflops, uh, 64 gigabytes of very fast memory on the device. Um, and more importantly, it's also something that uh, a chip that's designed from the get-go to be connected together uh, with very fast interconnect between the different chips because we're really starting to think about the entire uh, system level design and, and not just at the, on the chip per chip basis. So um, each chip uh, is connected through uh, TPU pods, which connect 64 uh, TPUs together. The total is about 11.5 uh, petaflops. It's got four terabytes of memory total and a mesh network that connects everything in a toroidal fashion. So it's starting to really look like a deep learning supercomputer with uh, uh, the entire stack being optimized for the kind of workloads that, uh, that we care about. Um, the, the result so far is that with about one eighth of a, uh, of a TPU pod, we can train our uh, machine translation models uh, about four times faster than on 32 of the best commercially available GPUs. So it's starting to uh, look very interesting from a, from a, a, a training standpoint and um, really will hopefully change how we train models and what kind of data we can uh, pump through those models and, uh, and the kind of exploration that we can do. Um, we are actually opening up some of those TPUs for research. So we are making available a thousand cloud VMs uh, for free uh, to researchers that apply um, and that uh, are committed to open machine learning research. So if you're interested, you can go sign up at uh, g.co slash TPU sign up. Um, the application process is, is ongoing right now. So in conclusion, there's a lot of opportunities, right? I talked just about model architecture, optimization and co-design, talked a bit about model placement, but you can think that the entire stack of the machine learning could be learned and could be optimized and co-optimized with the hardware. So that includes optimization strategies, data representation, uh, hyperparameter tuning, what we really need is a measure of costs, right? Now we're, our cost today has been accuracy because that's what we publish papers on. But the real cost for us, it's error rates times time to completion, times money in some ways. It can be power, it can be uh, time to result, latency, anything that you want. Now, if you can formulate that as a cost, we can put that as one of the factors in our machine learning design and run out our automated tools to come up with new models that will uh, work faster on, on, on those systems. So for, for us, we need new simulators, we need new design ideas, we need new free parameters that we can play with and, and optimize over to really try and figure out how we, um, how we can uh, tailor our models to, uh, to, to those kinds of, uh, of hardware. The risk obviously is what if we co-adapt and you know, it's, an, it's, it's, it's an optimization process, right? So we're gonna land in a no local optimum of you know, the perfect hardware for the perfect machine learning. And the big risk is what, if, what happens if that local optimum is really far from the global optimum? What if tomorrow like super sparse matrix multiplies would actually much, be much better for us? in some ways for the kind of machine learning models that we haven't thought about uh, right now. What if you know, high precision uh, matrix multipliers or high precision computation is something that we actually would need to really make uh, our models shine? Uh, there's a lot of questions that are around this, uh, and, but the opportunity at least to uh, get optimized within our little neighborhood and we're with uh, our little local optimal of deep learning is our, our, our huge. And um, so I'm hoping we'll have a lot more conversations with um, hardware folks uh, on this topic in general. Cool, that's all I had. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned this idea of having a cost function that includes hardware performance. This is a great idea. This community needs to do this. 
Um, I'm curious if you have thoughts about whether we could do this the other way. Could we not search for a model that is efficient from a computational perspective? Can we also turn this around and search for hardware that's efficient for the space of models that we think is useful? If you have a way of automating, of expressing a hardware in a way that's parameterizable and that we can search over, yes, absolutely. Right, Searching for the right hardware. Um, if you can model your hardware, if you can simulate it, or if you can, you know, if, if, if your inner loop of your optimization is, you know, going to the HDL and going to the fab, and that's never going to work. So we need to have a proxy for hardware. And so that's, I think that's in the camp of, you know, the hardware community to come up with ways they can expose hardware potentialities to machine learning researchers so that we can do this search and help uh, match up basically <coughs> models and hardware. But that would be really interesting, definitely. Uh, Vincent? Yeah, you had a slide uh, comparing uh, the TPU number two uh, to 32 GPUs. Um, one eight, yes, this one, right? Uh, um, do they comp do this number one eight of a 64 TPU pod and 32 GPU compare in terms of power or space in a rack, or uh, why did you pick these numbers? I picked this number yeah. because it was given to me by the yeah. people who know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, um, and Can't tell us no, I, 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 I don't know. There, 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 it's a many-dimensional optimization problem, right? You can, you can only focus on speed and say it's x for x faster. Really, what matters at the end of the day is cost, right? Total cost of ownership. How much does it cost for us to run those things? Because at the end of the day, we're going to want to build as much as we can of those systems because we know we we're going to be wanting to train more and more models, right? So the cost is a big factor. Uh, cost includes power, it includes time to results, it includes, it's a very many dimensional optimization, so it's very hard to boil it down to uh, just the one number. Okay, yeah, thank you. I've got the mic, if I can ask a question. So, yeah, so, uh, I have a question, so. Uh, oh, wait, I think somebody. Somebody? Uh, Go ahead. Okay, so my question is that uh, um, given like, you know, in the, the, you talk about machine translation workload, would you find it more to be memory bound or compute bound in terms of TPU? Machine translation, is it memory bound or compute bound? I do not know. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the, the models have evolved quite rapidly in, in machine translation. There's a lot of new things that are happening where, um, for example, the best uh, sort of LSTM models we have right now are um, distributed over many, many GPUs and uh, are also using um, uh, kind of, uh, um, I'm blanking on the name, uh, but mixture of experts representations, so very sparse connectivity between the different GPUs, and that seems to work uh, pretty well. So the, the, I think the, the, the constraints change depending on which model you're talking about. Hey, I was really intrigued by the meta-learning discussion, where it sounded like the idea was to take these things which takes, take the hyperparameters of your model and put an extra level of training on top of those hyperparameters to choose them. But when you got started, I was actually expecting you to say a different thing, which is to take hyperparameters and try to demote them down to normal parameters so they get trained during the normal backpropagation workflow of your model. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you decide when to do one versus the other, like how you expect one of those two approaches to work when the other doesn't. Uh, the, the difference between hyperparameters and parameters sometimes veer on the uh, it, 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 it's sometimes not very, uh, we, we often consider hyperparameters to be the things we cannot backprop through directly. The things that, um, because they are part of the optimization and not part of the model. And so that's why we have to use things like revolutionary strategies or black box optimization or reinforcement learning to optimize those. 
um, there, a lot of them are also fundamentally discrete, right? So the size of a layer, that's a discrete value. Um, we can't necessarily, uh, you know, optimize it using a gradient descent. Or, or and, and some of them are just uh, regularization hyperparameters, so you can't optimize on the training set. That's right. You have to optimize them on the validation set. That's a very good point. Um, so there's, there are a lot of complexities there that, uh, that if you want to learn the entire system, you have to be careful about what you do. Um, and, um, and it's very difficult to, to formulate it in a way that will not just find a trivial optimization solution that will not generalize. So thanks for the beautiful talk. Uh, but I'd like to come back to the comparison between GPUs and TPUs. So if I just do the algebra, it looks like one TPU is pro about the same speed as one GPU. I mean, 64 divided by 8 is 8 times 4 is 32. So what's, what's uh, where's the catch? Uh, 64 divided by 8. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. They're doing the math for me. I'm just letting it go. <laughs> cool. It's, you know, if you, if you consider one chip, it's going to be, you know, within an order of magnitude difference. So 4x sounds about right. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, between 4 and 69. There are many ways you can... Uh, you can attack the numbers, and since I'm okay. the authority okay. on the on the TPUs myself, I'm I'm not going to going to go further on that. All right, all right, all right. thanks. Um, I guess I hope you have signed up. Uh, my students oh. are all excited. Okay. So, so the one. Able to, I mean, as soon as we have, that's one of the interesting things. The, the 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 research cloud is really going to be so that people can actually, by themselves, test what the different performance trade-offs can look like and, and actually measure performance and actually you know, sort of see. What, as soon as you design custom hardware, you have to really change sometimes the way you uh, organize your data and the way you organize your computations. And there's a big challenge in optimizing the computation for the different hardware and understanding how that works can make a, a huge amount of difference. So the, the, the pure flop count is not really often the answer as to you know, what the, the question that you really want to know is how much better are you getting? So I have one question. Um, I really, really love all the work with TPU1 and TPU2.0. But what's always been the big question to me is if you factor in the research and development costs, the cost of taping out hardware production, et cetera, did you end up spending more, less, or about the same amount of money as you would have just going with GPUs? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> my guess is that we wouldn't be doing it if it was more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, th there's an interesting, uh, you know, there's an interesting sort of, uh, um, sort of, uh, sort of bigger effect about having out there alternatives to GPUs. Right? Absolutely, and uh, having more variety in in the marketplace, and having more access to different mm -hmm. uh, uh, hardware that can be tailored in different ways, and we, where we can make different decisions about the design, mm -hmm. I think is going to enrich the space uh, in many ways. Um, so th yeah. there is, you know, uh, there is good outcomes, no matter what. I agree. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, we got it. Oh, so question about, um, I think the example you gave of using evolutionary algorithms to sort of learn a new LSTM, if you will, interesting work. Um, but what drives some of us, hum or the, the human engineers crazy, is when you get more complex patterns that have to be now accelerated, right? Because I, I think that new LSTM is way more complex to compute than the old one. And so I wonder, how that gets taken into account, and maybe even just making a double size GRU uh, LS or you know RNN may have done the same amount of. Uh... It, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. Okay. So this but uh, has that trade off it, it been, been done? Has been controlled. Uh, we did a, a lot of careful experimenting about yeah. the different. Uh, it, it's not just about you know growing the capacity of the network. 
um, having a, a smarter computational unit actually made a difference. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question remains, right? Uh, can we make things simpler? There was no costs or, that I know of in that optimization that tried to reduce the complexity of the system or try to control for it, right? Um, and so you could land in a different, you could probably evolve something that would be simpler if that was your goal. Um, very often, um, you know, the, the, the simplicity comes at a cost, right? We, we, we see that over and over, like, uh, you know, in, in inception module that's extremely complex. To, to some it, it is complex, but you remove any part of it and it gets worse. So it's, it's, a, it's a reducible complexity. Do we have last three Sorry. I was just going to make one comment on the previous question. So uh, I'm from Google, and uh, just to answer your question on do we consider the cost of NRE and chips, we do take that seriously, and uh, the answer is we st it's still good. <laughs> I didn't know if we could answer that, so I'm glad Parta did. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, last two questions. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is the uh, uh, you showed the upper bound on the error rates that are achieved with the meta learning. Um, this one? Or? Yeah. So do you infer some kind of a law of physics here, or speed of light kind of thing, or is some limitation in the training model? Do you mean uh, looking at the envelope of yeah, those models? Yeah. Um, like God said, you, you'll never be like me kind of thing. Uh, no, I think it's more, um, you know, the, in a, in, in a sense, this process you can trade off uh, time versus parallelization. So if we had a bigger population, maybe we get to that outcome faster. Okay. Um, so it's it you know it, it, there's no deep meaning I think to, to it. No, but if you if you continue more than this 256 clock wall time clock hours, would you see? I don't expect that we would see much better. Um, I think we're quickly reaching the noise level on this data set in particular. Okay. Um, so anything that's you know good, very good there, it's very unclear that we can really improve on it uh, uh, significantly. Okay, and uh, I had a follow-up question on the NRE cost. Um, obviously, it seems like Google has made a uh, decision or inference that there's nothing new coming up, so they decided to go with an ASIC. Obviously, you have some preset activation functions and preset ways of the data flow, um, and you have invested quite a bit in the data center. And these are chips that you're not selling to others as well. Um, so what is the thinking behind that? Where do you think what's, what needs to be discovered is already discovered? I see somebody coming in the court and wanting to. So, so we are making the TPUs available on the cloud. And, uh, and, and really, TensorFlow is the kind of interface through which we are making it available. And in terms of the uh, broader uh, architectural questions, I think we are kind of in an uh, era when there's a lot of uh, opportunities here, so be keeping an option open, right? So this is what we're doing right now, but uh, I think it's an exciting time in computer architecture where there's going to be a lot of different things, so we'll see how things go. So one last question. Please tell if it's for Parta or Vincent. So. Um, well, we can answer it. Uh, just, uh, you know, GPUs and TPUs seem to be the in thing right now, but did you consider using CPU SIMD engines, and are there any problems that map well on those? So we use CPUs as well um, for training and for inference. Um, it, it ends up being, you know, we have a, a very large uh, cloud, and so we have a lot of CPUs available. If they are available, uh, especially at downtimes, you know, we can use them for uh, for training and inference. And that ends up being often kind of a, a sort of ease of use and uh, also capa capacity decision. So, for example. For every GPU that we have on a machine, we have some cores of CPUs that are sitting there that are usable that we might as well take advantage of. So very often we ship some of the computation to the CPU in parallel to the GPU to maximize the utilization of the machine. Or um, we use the very low priority CPUs that are available at night when you know, less things are happening or on the weekends uh, to uh, sort of backfill some training pipelines. So we're, you know, we're pretty agnostic to whatever works. Um, some problems are more time to result sensitive than others. Some others you just run for. What percentage of the work would you say happens on CPUs versus? I can't, I can tell, I don't know. Not sure. 
it used to be most of it. Most was on CPU, in, uh, you know, back in 2011, 2012. And obviously, we, we used a ton of CPU uh, at the time. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker.